All right, so this video is going to talk about independent sub procedures um, as opposed to the event sub procedures or event procedures that we talked about in the last video. These ones are the sub procedures, but they are not tied to any event. Uh, we are covering F6.2, independent sub procedures, and also F6.3, passing information to a procedure. As the name might suggest, an independent sub procedure is one of those sub procedures the ones that we declare by saying private sub, uh, that are not connected to any objects or events. Uh, they are processed when a statement in your code calls it or invokes it. Um, so rather than Visual Basic invoking your, um, your event procedures when the associated event or events show up, in this case, we're talking about sub procedures that are invoked by you or some other uh, person who's working on a team project or something like that. But uh, they, they are being manually invoked by typing out that procedure's name and giving it information that it needs. That's the act of calling it. Now, these independent sub procedures are going to be super, super helpful for a lot of different reasons. Uh, you can avoid duplicating code. If you have some calculation that needs to be done or some task that needs to be performed um, in multiple different procedures that you're working on, maybe multiple different ev event procedures or something, uh, you can avoid duplicating that code by putting all of that duplicated code in one uh, independent procedure. Uh, for example, if you have multiple things that are, uh, you know, that require clearing out the output label, um, and maybe these multiple things uh, either, you know, they, they either have different parameters or each of those different tasks have very different things that happen before the um, output label or output labels gets cleared, right? Uh, you can't combine all of those into one event procedure with multiple events or something like that. So you might need an independent sub procedure to help out and do that clearing of the output label for those multiple procedures. So it can be really helpful. Um, and then when, you, when you're avoiding duplicating code by taking everything that would be duplicated and putting it in one place, if you need to change what happens because maybe you changed the name of a control or you made a mistake and you need to fix it or you need to change the behavior of it, maybe it's not clearing out, but maybe it's resetting it to be, uh, you know, putting a default value into the label or something like that. like. Um, you wouldn't need to modify it in all the places that would normally have to handle that. Instead, you can just modify it in only one place. Uh, you also make your procedures easier to code and understand. Um, if an event procedure is performing many different tasks, like it's collecting input, it's doing this crazy complicated calculation, and then from there, it display some output, and then it does another crazy complicated calculation, and all that kind of stuff. Even if it's not duplicated, or anything like that, you could just put some of those crazy complicated calculations into their own independent procedures, into like a helper procedure, right? And then your event procedure suddenly looks a lot cleaner and easier to understand. And then people looking at it can say, oh, well, when the calculate button is pressed, it does this calculation, which I know what that calculation is thanks to the procedure name that is so very clearly created. And then it does display some output, and then it does this next calculation. That's so clear to me, I can understand exactly what's going on. Now that I know this, let me take a look at these calculation procedures to understand the specifics of the calculation. So the event procedure, uh, you know, if your event procedures are getting really complicated, having some 
helper uh, independent procedures can be helpful for making it a lot more clear what the procedure is e is actually doing uh, even if you know that complicated code is only used in one place anyway even if you're not avoiding duplications or something like that so it's super helpful uh, it also means that it's easier for you to fix any mistakes because you know exactly where the location of the um, procedure containing that particular calculation is. Like you can actually look in that code rather than trying to hunt through a very complicated event procedure that just has everything bundled into it. So it's very helpful. Um, another, you know, it helps you, it helps make it easier to code as well. Because you code up the uh, helper procedure, and then maybe you have like a, a quick test application to make sure that it works by uh, entering a value and then displaying the output. But then you can kind of plug that into whatever event procedure that actually is supposed to do that calculation. And you know that the, um, you already know that the helper function is working right. So then you just know exactly where an issue is if the calculate button isn't working properly um it also helps because if yeah if you know the um that there's an error happening in the calculation then you can go to the helper procedure that does the calculation so all that kind of stuff can be really helpful uh also in terms of easier to code and understand and also in terms of avoiding duplicating code if you have i talked about uh calculations or pieces of code or something like that repeated across multiple different event procedures or something like that but this could even work for if they're repeated multiple times in the same uh, procedure so that's really helpful and then it allows a large team to actually code the application because when you are programming you are probably going to be working as a team which means that people are going to have certain responsibilities where they're going to build up a specific code base probably of specific functions but they'll build up like okay the you know you have a um application that's supposed to do a whole bunch of financial calculations well one person might be in charge of making the functions that do a particular financial calculation and another person might be in charge of a similar thing but for a different financial calculation they're writing a whole bunch of procedures for another ca financial calculation and then the person who's in charge of actually making the application kind of run all that stuff is going to be able to like design the application and then they can uh use event procedures that actually call the work done by other programmers in order to really just tie everything together. So the team will write, you know, they'll break up everything that the application has to do into small tasks, and then they will solve all of those tasks using independent functions, and then all of those independent functions will get hooked into the actual event procedures that uh, need to handle them. So it's super, super useful. All right, so this is the syntax for a um, subprocedure, an independent subprocedure that has no parameters. We've seen two parameters before in our event procedures. Uh, right now, we're just going to worry about no parameters. So you would start it out as normal, private, sub, and then the name of the procedure, following the uh, guidelines, strongly suggested guidelines from the last video. Uh, private sub procedure name. And then you put two parentheses with nothing inside of them. Also, there is no handles clause at the end. You ignore that. It's just private sub procedure name, left parenthesis, right parenthesis. You hit enter. Uh, you have all of your statements indented inside of that. And then you type end sub to uh, signify that you are done writing the procedure. Everything after that is going to be another procedure or something. Um, but that's how you create a uh, independent sub procedure. When you call it, 
you're going to be calling it from inside of another procedure. So you'll be working on, let's say, some event procedure or even another independent sub procedure. You'll be inside of there and you decide that you need to make procedure name do whatever procedure name does. Well, when it has, when procedure name has no parameters, then you call it by typing procedure name like this and then typing parentheses, left parenthesis, left parenthesis, right parenthesis, just like that. All right, so what we have here is an application for some, you know, students of some history professor who's teaching History 101 and History 201. Uh, history 101 is graded in a pretty standard way. You know, you have A, B, C, D, and F, where A is if you have a grade of 90 or higher, B is if you have a grade of 80 or higher, and so on and so forth. Um, now, History 201 is graded pass-fail. If your uh, grade is 75 or higher, you pass. If it's less, you fail. Now, the way this works is I type in my grade. I got 80 points in History 101. I can display my grade. I have a B right there. Uh, if I check out 80 points in History 201, I have a pass. However, if I uh, got like a 71.5, oh, 71 in History 101, that'd be a grade of C. And in History 201, it would be a grade of F. So notice you have History 101 and History 201 behaving very differently, which means that they need separate logic to uh, make all of that happen. So let's take a look at that. Now, this button display underscore click right here. When we click the display button, the only thing it does is it checks if uh, I've checked History 101. If I haven't checked History 101, that means I have checked History 201. Because there's only two of those radio buttons right there. It's only... Uh, if we look at the designer, History 101 and History 201. Um, so if I've checked 101, I have not checked 201. And if I have checked 201, I have not checked 101. The only way that this is false is if I have checked 201, which means that I want to check my 201 grade. But that's how that if statement is working. If I'm in History 101, if I have checked red rad his 101 uh radio button history 101 if that checked is true then uh it's going to calculate and display my grade not calculate it's going to display my grade in 101 a b c d or f otherwise and the only other case is if i've checked 201 it's going to uh calculate my grade pass or fail now it's done uh, it's made two functions right here. Not the functions, I apologize. Independent sub procedures. One for the grade for History 101 and one for the grade for History 201. Now here's the uh, display grade 101. The procedure name says that it is displaying, that's the verb, a grade for 101. And there's only History 101 in question here, so that's a fine name. Um, it's going to get the number of points from the text box and then select case to determine what my grade is by checking these different ranges right here and then uh, putting the appropriate grade inside of the text property of label grade. Now, the reason why this is use uh, this is its own and you know sub procedure right here. Sure, it would be fine to put it as a nested selection structure. But there's a lot going on here. And it kind of gets muddied up because it's in this procedure that's also handling grades for 201. 
Whereas if we just put it in Display Grade 101, we're in this kind of environment where this is the History 101s that we are not worrying about History 201. We are just handling History 101 stuff and it becomes a lot more clear why we're doing A, B, C, D, and F versus Pass and Fail. We don't need to worry about, oh, is this, is this right? Should I be doing A, B, C, D, and F? Am I really like in the 201 area? Anything like that. We don't need to worry about that here. We'll worry about it when we're talking about button display dot click, just to make sure that we're doing the 101 thing when 101 is true. We're doing the 201 thing when 101 is false, right? But up here, when we are inside of this procedure, this sub procedure right here, we know that we can assume the user has selected one history 101 sort of similar to how we can make those kinds of assumptions in uh, if statements and case statements like right here if we're inside of the uh, case is greater than or equal to 80 we can assume that it's less than 90 because we're not in the case greater than or equal to 90. in a similar way that we can assume that we can also assume that because we're in display grade 101, we're not worrying about 201 stuff. We don't need to worry about pass or fail. So that's a really nice thing about that. And it's clearing up our button display underscore click right here. But you can see it calling display grade 101. It uh, they type display grade 101 and then they type the two parentheses like that. And here is the header for display grade 101. You see that it has no parameters because it just has the two parentheses open, close, just like that. No parameters inside. You and then you um you know you do everything as you would inside of a normal uh, procedure, which is very nice. And then of course uh, down here we have the call to display grade two hundred one. If it is false, that uh, radio button history one hundred one dot checked is true which it is. So we come up here. Uh, we pretty much do the same thing as up in 101, except for the fact that we're doing a pass fail where the pass is 75 or greater and the fail is less than 75. So because of this difference right here, the different way in which we are calculating the grade for 201 versus 101, that's why we have two separate functions like this. But it makes things a lot easier to understand and a lot neater than if we just pasted all of those selection statements inside of this one. And in fact, we'd have like three, you know, there's three layers of indentation in this select case. If we put that inside of an if statement here, that would be four layers of indentation. That gets a lot pretty messy, as well as we would also have this nested if statement inside of here. I mean, imagine what the flowchart looks like on the on that, right? If we weren't using a call to a procedure. So it cleans things up. It makes it easier to understand. It makes it easier to read. And that's really important because it makes it easier for us to find and fix mistakes in code. So highly recommend doing something like this. That's why independent sub procedures are beneficial even if you're not getting rid of duplication. All right, let's talk more about parameters. This is what I showed you in the last video. Their information passed through procedure when a procedure is invoked. They like a procedure scope variable, they're not initialized until a procedure is invoked and values are given to them when the procedure starts running. But now we know more about how procedures work because we know about like calling them and stuff like that. We have these independent procedures and we've only seen the no parameter version of it. But the fact that I specify the no parameter version means that there's a parameter version, right? So we should probably expand our idea of parameters a little more here. Now, the value of a parameter is given by the caller. When, the, when you type out a call to a procedure, if that procedure has parameters, you need to give the values for those parameters as you're calling it. And it's very specific in how you have to do that. Uh, We'll talk about that in a sec, but you're you're using 
you're giving arguments to put into the parameter. When you actually give the call, you pass in arguments, which end up being values that you pass into the parameter. So you're the one, when you're calling a procedure that actually has parameters, you um, actually put values into those parameters by way of arguments. And you've actually worked with this before with things like methods. Let's say the um, try parse method, right? The try parse method of double or integer or decimal, that took in arguments. Uh, it took in a string argument and it took in a numerical variable as an argument. Those were arguments that you were passing in to try parse and try parse has two parameters. So when you pass those arguments in, those arguments get put into the parameters and then tr try parse will run with those arguments. Um, actually put in the, in its parameters. So the local scope or the procedure scope variable that the parameter is, has the value of the arguments that you gave it. A similar thing kind of happens when Visual Basic invokes your event procedures is it puts arguments into the parameters for sender and that E of type event args. It, it puts values in there by way of calling it and passing in arguments. But that's what, when you put expressions between parentheses when you are calling a procedure like that, you know, even including some method like uh, a, the dot add method of an item collection or the dot try parse method of a um, double or integer or whatever, right? Um, those are arguments that you are passing in and they get put into the parameters of those uh, procedures. So when you are uh, creating a sub procedure with more than zero parameters, so at least one, you're going to put those parameters inside of the parentheses rather than just saying opening parenthesis, closing parenthesis immediately. You put those parameters in separated by commas, um, but everything else is the same. The difference is that you are putting in parameters like this. Now, when you're calling a procedure with parameters, you are passing in arguments, which are just some expression that will evaluate to a value. So you can put in a literal, you can put in a variable that has a value in it. You could even put in some like mathematical operation, like some, uh, some variable int blah plus three. That could be an argument, right? Um, all like whatever it is, you just have to pass in some expression that will eventually become a value. And as soon as all of these arguments have been evaluated and turned into values, then procedure name, the, the, the procedure called procedure name will stop whatever you're doing in the function that's calling it, you know, let's say you call it in the procedure, uh, button calc underscore click. Well, when you call a procedure name like this and you pass in all the arguments, all the arguments get evaluated and then button calc underscore click pauses while procedure name runs with all of those values in its parameters. It will run fully and completely and then exit. And as soon as proce procedure name exits, button calc underscore click will continue running. That's important to know. When you call a procedure, you are interrupting the, pro the uh, procedure you're currently working in. Now, I really want to highlight that you're going to use private right here. I've talked about private versus public for this. Private just means that no one outside of form, the, the main form, can actually use your procedure, which is important. Now, what's really important is that when you are calling procedure name, uh, procedure name has parameter 0, parameter 1, dot, 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 parameter n. Well, the first argument I'm going to specify is the argument that will go into parameter zero. So arg zero, right? That is some expression 
the value of which I want to put into parameter zero. Then after the first argument, I'll put a comma and write out the second argument, which is arg1 in this case. Arg1 because that's the argument that gets put into parameter one. You know, the, the value after I, um, or after if Visual Basic evaluates it, that, that value is going to get put into parameter one. Arg2 will get put into parameter 2, Arg3 will get put into parameter 3, and so on and so forth, until we get to the end, Argn will get put into parameter n. Now each argument is given an order. If you give it out of order, let's say I put argument 1 before argument 0, it's going to assume that I'm trying to put argument 1 inside of parameter 0, and argument 0 inside of parameter 1. That would be bad. So each argument must be given in order. That's this point down here. Each argument must match the type of its parameter. So if parameter zero needs to be an integer, argument zero needs to be an integer as well so that we can put the integer into the integer. Um, if parameter one is a double, arg one must also be a double. Although it can be an integer. Well, mm, depending, depending, sometimes. You have like the implicit type conversion where an integer can be converted to a double, that would be okay. But if argument one was an integer um, variable, you might run into some trouble and we'll get to that. Like we'll get to the stuff that might make you run into trouble there. But to be safe, just make sure every argument matches the type of its parameter. Also, if Procedure, if a procedure name takes in n parameters, or I guess this is n plus 1 parameters, that's my bad. But exactly n plus 1, in this case, arguments must be given. If I gave 1 too many, that argument wouldn't have anywhere to go, and that would be an error. And also a security risk if Visual Basic let that happen, so it doesn't let that happen. If argument... Uh, if I gave one too few arguments, if I gave n instead of n plus one, like what I typed, um, if I gave one too few, then in this case parameter n would not have an argument. And if I might try to get an argument from somewhere, it might take random data into it, which would also be a security risk. Because then it's taking in random data and we don't know what could, what's in that random data. It could be my... Um, my banking password for all we know. Probably not because I don't keep that uh, saved on my computer. But it could be something bad. So we can't let that happen either. You have to give exactly the right amount of arguments in exactly the right order with exactly the right type. So I'll show you some code in just a second, but I want to talk about what happens when we pass variables as arguments, because that actually gets to a tricky problem. Um, now, if we were passing just straight up liter literal values, everything is fine because we're sticking literal values into um, parameters, but we're usually not doing too much of that because usually we're doing work based off of user input and a lot of times because we don't know what user input is really going to be, uh, we're sticking that stuff in variables and then stuff that happens based on user input is also going to be in variables and all that kind of stuff. So oftentimes we're passing a lot of variables in. Now we might pass in variable, like, you know, some expression where we have a variable that goes through some operators and you get a nice clean value out of that and you can pass that nice clean value into the parameter when you call a function just fine. That's fine. But the real problem is when you pass a variable by itself. Now, variables are names that are associated with an address. You know, they are pointing to some memory location. They have a memory address. And that address is where their data, the data that is their value is contained. It's like, you know, they have the locker number for the locker in the pool that 
they are using, that they're keeping their valuables in while they're going swimming, right? Variables have that memory address. In fact, you could say that they have it as much as they also have the data contained inside of that memory address. But here's the thing. Um, parameters act as variables and parameters have a memory location. They have an address where data is stored. So arguments are actually put into the parameters memory location as well. Which means that when we pass in a variable as a parameter, things get a little bit confusing. Because, well, I'll, I'll try to explain why. Now, suppose I have a calc square root procedure, which takes in one parameter, uh, double num as double. So it's a of type double. It is uh, called double num. There's a keyword that goes right here, but I'm not going to tell you what that is just yet. Just know that there is one. Now, what this does, uh, and this is pretty inefficient, so you wouldn't normally do it like this, but for the sake of the example, I take this parameter double num and I set it equal to the square root of itself. So double num uh, exponent equals 0 0.5. And then I convert that to a string and stick it in the text property of some label. Now suppose in another procedure, I have uh, some code that gets the text from a text box and sticks it into a, and I want to emphasize this is a separate double num variable, even though the, this double num variable has the same name as the double num parameter up here, both of these have procedure scope. So they do not exist outside of their own procedure, so they can't even see that the other one exists. This is calc square roots double num, and this is, let's say, button calc dot click, or underscore clicks double num. But I really want to make that clear. They're not the same variable, regardless. I uh, get some user value and stick it into double num, and then I calculate the square root of it, and it's, you know, stick that in the label right here. So that is the idea of what's going on in this program. The question is, when I call calc square root and pass in double num as a parameter, what actually, oh sorry, as an argument, what gets passed into the parameter of calc square root when it starts to run? Does it get our, uh, the memory address of the variable argument, or does it get the value inside of the variable? That's the real question here, and it might not seem like it at first, but it makes a huge difference whether the parameter of calc square root gets the memory address or the value of the variable argument. That's why variables can be really tricky, because we have to figure out if it's getting the memory address or the value. Well, the nice thing is we get to choose. Um, we can, we have two ways of passing variable arguments in to a, um, into a procedure like this. We can pass by value where we take the argument, or we take the value of the variable, we make a copy of it, and we put that copy into the parameter. And then the parameter can do whatever it wants with that copy, but because it's a copy, it's not making any changes. We can also pass by reference, and the reference in this case is the memory address, which refers to the stuff that's inside of the variable, or inside of the memory location that the variable holds. So. We're putting the argument variable's memory address into the parameter so that the parameter can mess with that value directly. So let me try to show off the differences between pass by, pass by value and pass by reference like this, because in a lot of cases they'll be functionally the same, but then there are the cases where they 
work a lot differently. So let's take a look. Okay, so what I have is a very quick and dirty program that I've thrown together. It has a text box where the user can put in a number that they will want to see the square root of. And then a lot of labels. Essentially, what I'm doing is I'm looking at the... Um, actually, let's take a look at button calc underscore click, because that is the, uh, the main driving procedure of all this. So, what I do first, and actually, this is a really cool feature of triparse that you might enjoy. Triparse actually returns a Boolean value. We'll talk about returning in soon, but triparse, when you run triparse and it actually uh, converts the string into a number and puts that into your um, variable like this, after doing all of that, the whole thing gets replaced by true if it successfully did the conversion or false if it did not successfully do the conversion. And if it did not do the conversion successfully, um, if it did not do the conversion successfully, not only will double num have the number zero here, but this whole thing gets returned, uh, uh, becomes false, which means I can actually use that to uh, detect if the user gave bad input and then throw an error message and then actually exit prematurely. That's the other thing I want to show. Exit sub. When you're working in a sub procedure like this, you can type exit sub to exit prematurely like this, which means that I can detect if the user gave me bad input and then get out of there early and not worry about risking the sanctity of my calculations. Also, it means I don't have to keep everything under an ugly uh, else um, branch. I can show that off real quick. So if I type in blah, then it's going to show uh, run this independent sub procedure right here. Error all label um, gives an error in all of my labels right here. In this case, not a number. And then it exits the sub. It doesn't try to do any calculations with the zero because you know normally double num would be zero, but we wouldn't have any way of knowing if double num was actually zero or not. If I actually type in zero, then you see zero. So it's a good way of telling whether or not the zero was from an actual zero or whether it was from uh, invalid input. But you also have things like catching the key pressed event to prevent your uh, users from typing in letters anyway, which can mitigate it somewhat, but not completely, regardless. Uh, I, those features are kind of cool. But now, all of that error catching stuff aside, um, what I do right here, you know, after this if statement, we've, inside of the if statement, we exit sub. So if the user gives bad input, we get out of there. We don't run the rest of this code right here, which means that if we're down here, we know that double num is actually a number, so we're okay to continue. And I could probably also do something as well, where I say um, something like, and also, uh, oh, my apologies. If it's not a number or else, um, double num is less than zero, right? Because um, if double num is less than zero, we don't want to put a negative number to the square root of a negative number, right? Uh, so that would be bad. We can check for if it's invalid. And the nice thing about the or else is that, um, and I'll just do this just in case, but the order of operations should be fine. This, the nice thing about the or else is that if this whole thing is false, if double num did not successfully get a number because this text was invalid, we short circuit evaluation and get in there, which means that we're never checking if double num is less than zero. If double num is not a number, we can't see if it's less than zero very successfully. So when we do short circuit evaluation right here, if this thing is true, that means that double num is not a number. If this is false and we're over here, that means that double num is a number and we can check if it's less than zero. I guess that's the other thing about the uh, error condition that is 
cool that we can do. So now down here, when we know double num not only is a number at this point, but it's a uh, non-negative number, which means that we can actually take the square root of it. What I'm doing is I'm first just displaying what double num is. The value of the variable double num, I'm putting that inside of label num zero dot text. Next, what I'm doing is I have a function that takes the square root of double num and we'll stick that into uh, one of my output labels here, label by value one. I'll show that in a minute. But I'm taking the square root, but I'm specifically passing in double num as a number. I'm passing it in by value. So whatever value double num has, I'm making a copy of that value and I'm passing that copy in. And that will be given to the first parameter of square root by value. After square root by value is done, and this procedure happens fully completes before we move on to the next line. Now on line 45, I'm putting double num into label num2 rather than label num0. I'm putting it into label num2.txt. You might wonder why I'm doing that, because double num hasn't changed at all. We'll see. So now I do the same thing as above, but I pass it into this procedure, square root by reference, which is going to take double num in, but I'm passing by reference, so I'm passing the memory address rather than the value. So it's getting the memory address of double num. It's not getting the copy of the value. And then I'm, I'm giving it another label, which is different than this one. And then what I do is I display double num's value again, which it should be the same because it hasn't changed at all. You know, it hasn't changed in here. And whatever parameter is inside of square root by ref is a different variable. So whatever happens in square root by ref, as well as square root by val, right? Whatever happens in those procedures shouldn't affect double num here because they're different variables. I'm lying to you. I'll talk about why I'm lying in a sec, but they are different variables. So I, I display the, the value again. And then for good measure, I run the procedure square root by ref a second time, passing in double num again, label, re label by ref uh, five this time as the label rather than label by ref three. And you might wonder why I'm passing in different labels. It's actually for convenience. It's so that I don't have to hard code labels into each procedure. And instead I can pass in the different labels. I can make these different labels instead of having to um, worry about hard coding it and then overwriting it when I call it again. It makes it a little bit easier. And I'll show you how it works in just a sec. But I'm passing it by reference. Uh, at step three and step five right here, passing in double num. And then I display double num for a final time, and then that is the end of the calculate uh, button, the button calculate underscore click procedure. And here are the two procedures, the stars of the show in this case. Um, we have square root by val and square root by ref. They are almost exactly the same except for the fact that I'm passing double num in by value. That's what by val stands for right here. When you pass in a value, uh, when you're passing by value like this, you type in by val before the name. When you're passing in by reference like this, you type in by ref before the name of the parameter. But that is exactly um, you know, they both work exactly the same otherwise. We have the double num parameter, which contains some number. We update that parameter's value using a um, using the exponentiation assignment operator. So we set double num equal to the square root of itself. And then we display the output value, double num equals or we, we uh, put double num in both cases into the dot text 
property. Uh, and then also, this is where I um, passed in the labels like this so that I don't have to specify label by ref3 here because if I specified label by ref3, then I couldn't actually also do label by ref5 and I'd have to remake square root by ref. So why not save myself the duplication and just pass in the label as a parameter itself? So that can be helpful to do. But yeah, that's the difference. I'm passing this in by value. Double num gets a copy of the value passed into it. But double num here in, by, in the square root by ref gets, a, um, gets the memory address of the variable passed into it. Now, double num could also get a number, and it has to be able to handle a number, but when it does get a variable, it instead gets like an address to a variable rather than the actual variable itself. So let's see it in action. All right, so I am just going to get right into the number 81 right here. The square root of 81 is 9. And we would expect double num's value to because double num's value, right? That is all being displayed in button calc. And double num shouldn't be affected by any of the square root functions because those square root functions are a different double num. This one right here, you know, at steps 0, 2, 4, and 6 should be unaffected. So it should remain. 81, and we would expect all of these square root functions to give us 9, which is not what happens. Because it starts out at 81, and then we pass double num by val by value into square root by value. We pass in a copy of that number 81 into square root by value. So double num gets replaced by the number 81 and that gets sent into square root by value. Totally fine. It's when we get to square root by ref that we start seeing some issues because right here, we're passing in the address to double num. And the importance of that is when we um, come down here to square root by ref and we, this double num gets the address to the data of the other double num. Well, they're both, they both have an address to the same data, right? They're different variables but they both are pointing to the same piece of data. They both have keys to the same storage locker, which is a problem. And in this case, it's a problem because square root by ref's double num, it, well, that gets modified. Square root by ref modifies it, sets it equal to the square root of itself. And so we're modifying that memory, that shared piece of memory to become the square root of itself, which means that back up here, this double num, the one in button calc underscore click, has also been modified to the square root of itself, which is why uh, square root by ref output, you know, so at step two, double num in button calc underscore click is 81, and the square root by ref output is nine, and then double num value is now nine. And then we run square root by ref again, that's three, and then double num becomes three because we've taken the square root of it again. And if we kept on doing it, we'd be taking the square root over and over and over and over again. That would be a problem. So we don't want to do that. And this would be the case even if, I'm going to stop the application, I change this to double x. This is double x. And this is double x to show you that it truly doesn't make a difference what this parameter is named. 81 again, calculate, and it works the exact same way. The name of the square root by ref parameter is irrelevant. The fact that we passed in double num into square root by ref by reference is the issue. So the benefit here is if you want to modify a variable within a procedure, you can pass it by reference and have that procedure modify the variable. In fact, that's what tryparse does because you pass 
you give triparse a variable that you want to be modified, like double num up here. We give it double num and then triparse gets it by reference and is able to use its parameter that has the same memory location as double num in order to actually put a value into double num. So there are good ways of using that. You can get data out of a procedure or one of these sub procedures like this. And you can do that with as many parameters as you want if you pass them all by reference. That's really great. However, you run the risk of having side effects like this if you use pass by reference carelessly and you change the value inside of a parameter that you did pass by reference to. So you have to be careful about that. If you're doing pass by reference, don't modify the parameter like this. Now, this isn't modifying the parameter. When I do label out dot text, that's not modifying the parameter. I'm getting the object that the parameter holds and then using the dot text property of that object, which is totally fine. It's the same thing as if I said wrote a uh, label ref uh, label by ref three dot text, except for the fact that I'm calling it label out instead. Label by ref three is a variable that refers to that object, just like how label object uh, label out is a variable that refers to the same object because I pass it by ref. If you're passing controls in this way, you want to use by ref. So that's a super helpful way of doing it. Now, of course, you can avoid all this trouble by doing this. You do double x to the power of 0 0.5 times, or sorry, dot to string. Uh, and if we run that, you one. We don't have a problem whatsoever. The problem was that we did assignment. We changed the value of that parameter that was passed by reference. Uh, I believe if I undo this, uh, and I did something like this, double num times one, for example. I don't know why you would do this, but it's more to, to show what happens with the result of Aerith medic operations that also in this case i did that for step three which means four was not changed or was not affected and the reason why is because double num times one gets evaluated as an arithmetic expression this becomes the number 81 times 1, which becomes the number 81. It's as if I just gave it, you know, typed in the number 81 like that. So that's something as well. Although I wouldn't recommend doing that because you should be familiar with if you are using by reference instead of by value. If you need to go to all that trouble to not mess with your variables, just use by value. If you the only reason you should pass by reference is if you are taking advantage of the fact that you are passing by reference. The fact that you want to, you either want to um, use the same memory location in order to update the value of a variable, or if you're passing an object around. Because if you pass an object by value, it'd make a copy of that object, but a copy of an object is not the same thing as an object. Uh, you know, the, the same object as the original. And then if you're messing with a copy, you're not messing with the original. So you want to do that. That'd be the other big reason why you would want to use uh, pass by reference. Either to modify the value of a variable or to, which you also, by the way, I feel like you should, I feel like it should be said, you should do sparingly. But if you want to, if you want to do that, or if you want to, um, pass an object like that, that's when you would use by ref, otherwise by val. All right, and that is independent sub procedures. Um, a lot going into this video, but we are uh, 
over the hump with sub procedures right now. I'm going to take a quick detour before we talk about the other big type of procedures, so that's what's coming up.